we're going to do a couple of very short songs. If you just want to check, the first one will be on 66. These are very short songs that are appropriate, but I just wanted to start with these two today. And 826, 826. Good morning. Hope you've had a good week. We're going to ask Bill to check on daily Bible readers right quick. So if you're a daily Bible reader, raise your hand and Bill will do our quick count and get that done. Let's have a prayer as we begin. Now, Father, we're grateful for uh, your care and protection, uh, both uh, through the night and throughout our lives. And there are so many ways in which you have blessed us and cared for us that uh, we may not even be aware of. And for the blessings that we know and for your providential care that we don't even understand sometimes, uh, we're grateful for that. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of being able to worship today. We're grateful for the blessing of being able to assemble with uh, your family. And uh, we pray that you would bless us and help us both to uh, encourage one another and also to be encouraged by your word uh, through the time that we spend together. Uh, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned this earlier, but it just is just stuck in my mind. <clears throat> As we come back from Australia, this was Christmas of 90, uh, the Eastside Church had committed to raise $50,000 to buy New Testaments. Uh, the Iron Curtain had just fallen, and for a dollar a piece, they could print New Testaments. And um, members of the church 
didn't go on vacations, other things. And there was like a big thermometer over here on this side. And it was about a third up when we came back. And eventually, uh, the members repaid uh, the loan. But the thing that, and, and I was so glad we did that. I mean, just no exception. I was so glad that we did that. But if you have never read the Bible at all and you get a New Testament, what do you do when you come to Melchizedek? Who's Abraham? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, and so I was just, that, that's what could be done. That was appropriate. And I was just so pleased that we were able to put New Testaments in the hands of Russians who had never read the Bible at all. But the other side of me, my heart goes out to them because you would nearly have more questions than you have <clears throat> answers in terms of background and people if you don't know the narrative of, of the Old Testament. And that's why I still like the term object lesson, visual aid, the shadow and the type, the echo. And I was spending more time today than is probably on the, the regular program to do this, but the first side of the page, we are going to look specifically at the choosing of the tribe of Levi. And the reason this is significant is that the priest, and specifically the high priest, comes from the tribe of Levi. And before then we go into numbers, we're going to turn the page over, and the Hebrew writer is going to say when there's a change of the law, there's a change of priesthood. And because of the book of Hebrews, we have this very clear picture of Jesus Christ being our high priest. And he's not from the tribe of Levi. And what we're going to see is that if the Old Testament, or let's say the Old Covenant would be a better way to say that, if the Old Covenant was still in place, then Jesus would sin by being our high priest. So a very important transition from the covenant with Moses, which they broke, to the new covenant that is brought in by Christ is this reality of him being our priest. And especially talking with people who are considering becoming Christians and even new Christians, I tell them the, the specific point, and there's so many things that save us, there's 15 to 20 things that save us, but the specific point of our salvation is Jesus going into heaven, taking his blood and offering it on in, let's say in, the Holy of Holies, as the payment for our sin. And like I said, there's about 15 to 20 things that save us. We're saved by the Word, we're saved by faith, we're saved by grace, we're saved by a whole group of things. But that specific point is when Jesus goes in and offers that one-time sacrifice. So I wanted to start today. Here's our central idea. God is going to select the Levites. And if you want to do shadow and type, um, I like the word echo. You'll see and learn something from the Old Testament, and then you come across the idea in the New Testament, and you'll think, okay, now I understand what this means in the New Testament because that we had the object lesson from the Old Testament. But as we finish today, and this happens over and over again, I want us to again notice the contrast between God's faithfulness and Israel's faithlessness. And it's just, it's just one of those sad and sobering things. And remember when we talked about the covenant with Moses, it's bilateral and the people have said, all the things of this covenant we will keep. And they break it over and over and again to the point, and I just shudder when I read this, God kind of tells Moses, I'm just gonna wipe out the whole group of them and we'll start all over with you. And Moses intercedes for the people and will notice God's faithfulness in contrast to human faithlessness. Paul is going to talk to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10. These things are warnings for us not to desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. These things happened to them as a warning 
but were written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So I want to start and do some things in Leviticus just to kind of open a door in that. <clears throat> and I had a teacher who had, had spent just years and years in Hebrew in the Old Testament. And he said, for us and as Christians, of those first five books, the book that we kind of most identify with is Genesis. And I've mentioned this, but he said, if you were Hebrew, and especially as a father, and you could take your son, the book of Leviticus would have been the book that they most identified with because they could see and participate in so many of the things that we only read about. And if nothing else, and I'm being a little sarcastic when I say this, but if nothing else, when you read the book of Leviticus, you're grateful we're not under the old covenant. All of the stipulations, all of the things that were done, and yet you stop and think about it, nothing is insignificant to God. Little bitty details that we might, might not even think of, and we'll talk about this at a future time. The rabbis had counted 613 commandments in the Old Testament. And you just look at all of that list, and this is a part of what goes on in the book of Leviticus. So what we want to notice from not just the book of Leviticus only, but we'll just kind of use that as a, as a kind of a working point today. When I read the book of Leviticus, I see the word Levi. Okay? This is very terrible enunciation. Levi Iticus. So when you hear the word Leviticus, then if you notice, hear that word Levi, and the tribe of Levi is going to be chosen as the priest. And so because of that, then so many of the things that are clean and unclean, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that go on through the book, and the sacrifices are going to be given to us in the book of Leviticus. And one way that I think of the book of Leviticus is that it's a handbook for priests. And what tribe are the priests from? The tribe of Levi. Now, <clears throat> because I do most of this for five-year-olds, I never want to insult your intelligence, okay? But as our kids were growing up, I said, when you read the book of Leviticus, think of the acronym of the word PAST, P-A-S-T. And when you read the book of Leviticus, you're going to read about holy people, holy actions, holy seasons, and holy things. And notice the emphasis over and over and again on the things that are holy. And so that, that is something that's easy to kind of remember. When you see the book of Leviticus, then just think of the word past. And here are going to be holy people, holy actions, holy seasons, and holy things. Again, I'm with type and reality and shadow and echo. I'd encourage you sometime to just go to the book of Revelation and notice the things that are holy. I saw the holy city descending. We're going to have holy angels, a holy God. And the inhabitants, and I'm speaking of us, the, the human inhabitants of heaven are referred to with two words primarily, and one is we are servants. But the word that's used more often than anything else is the word saint. The sanctified ones. And the, the example of the need for holiness in God's presence is given to us on earth in the book of Leviticus because Yahweh is going to live and dwell among his people, and that's why we have to have a tabernacle, and we have to have a holy and a holy of holies, because the sinless God is moving among his people. But then if you just project in the future, and as we close last time, I, I had never seen this. Like I said, just a few years ago, I was reading a book on Revelation, and the writer said, if you look at the dimensions of the tabernacle, Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, if you look at the dimension of the Holy Holies in the temple, then this is the same proportion as heaven, even though heaven is much larger. And so there's a sense that when you read the book of Leviticus, then it helps us as human beings, as people who've never seen and beheld and been in the presence of a holy God, this is what it was like when God dwelt on earth. 
And as we live our lives, one of the things that we anticipate and we look forward to is that as saints, sanctified ones, then that's going to be our eternal dwelling place with God. Now, um, th there are good reasons that we don't call each other Saint so-and-so. Um, Saint Tim just doesn't just kind of roll off of our tongues, you know. Um, Saint Charles, and, and, and there's, re you know, just there, there's a little kind of conflict there. But when you stop and think about it, while we're not comfortable using that term, that's in fact who we are, the sanctified ones and the ones that are cleansed because of that. <clears throat> I'm under 1-1. One, one. If you look to the right of the acronym PAST, notice again the use of these terms, holy, 80 times in Leviticus. And I did this in this translation because the little research that I was doing uh, sometimes has headings, and that would have been too many, but still, you get the idea. Uh, the word clean, 57 times. But how significant even the word unclean. And again, for a sinless God to dwell among an unholy and unclean people, then these terms are very, very significant. I'm under 1-2. In Leviticus 8 through 10, God is specifically going to choose the tribe of Levi. And if you remember back when we talked about the rivalry between Leah and Rachel. I still just shudder because she names him Levi because now that I have given him three sons, my husband will now be joined to me. And yet, Levi and his brother are going to trick an entire town to being circumcised and they're going to kill him. So there's going to be some very difficult things that we have with Levi. But later, God's people are going to be committing immorality and it's going to be the Levites, and again, you kind of shudder, who take swords and start killing those who are immoral. And for whatever, his, and it's God's choice, but for whatever his reason, then God says, this is going to be the tribe from which the priests are going to come. And the only priests from Aaron down to when the veil of the temple is torn in two, if they are selected by the biblical account, they will be from the tribe of Levi. When you go from Malachi to Matthew, there's a time where the high priesthood is bought, not necessarily from the tribe of Levi, but that's, that's in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But here's something that, again, is just something that I always keep in my mind. <clears throat> we won't be able to get to the prophets, and um, it, while I'm in this class, the elders have asked me to, to be too much in each class uh, in our congregation. But when I look at the word prophet, notice this. A prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God. And how often are we going to hear Isaiah say, Thus saith the Lord. And I literally think of a, mouth, a mouthpiece, a spokesman for God. And in a very specific way, the prophet is going to call the people back to the covenant at Mount Sinai. And all the way through the Old Testament when a prophet says, Thus saith the Lord, then he is calling a covenant people, generations later, back to the standard of there. And even when you read the very, very last prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi, then he is still calling people back to the covenant of Moses. So a prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God. And let me just give us two words to anticipate. When I think of the prophet, and I will spell F-O-R-T-H, a prophet will foretell, he will speak to the people of his day. And this is the covenant, and you are selling the poor into slavery for a pair of shoes, Amos says, and thus says the Lord, that's sinful. So he will, F-O-R-T-H, he will foretell and speak God's word to his day. But through the Spirit, the prophet will also, F-O-R-E, foretell the things that God's going to do in the future. So when I think of a prophet... I literally think of the mouthpiece and the spokesman for God. On the other hand, when you look at the priest, and specifically the high priest, then the priest is going to speak to God on behalf of the people. 
And that's what all the sacrifices in these other offerings are for. And so when you look at those two major roles that people are going to play through the Old Testament, the prophet's going to say, this is what God wants you to know, thus saith the Lord. And then the priest then is going to intercede to God on behalf of the people. And that's going to be the role that he is going to take. The priest and the Levites are going to have a teaching capacity. They're going to work in the temple, eventually the tabernacle earlier. Uh, they're going to offer sacrifices and offerings. And this is very simplistic, but all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. So in the covenant with Moses, the only men who are selected and allowed to be priests are to come from this specific tribe. So we'll read through these very quickly, and then I want us to turn over and be thinking about what it means to us in the new covenant with Christ being our priest. But I'm under 1-3. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi near and set before them, or set before Aaron, the priest, that they may minister to him. So the Levites are going to be involved in the service and helping the priests with the worship and the other things that take place. They will perform duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting. As they minister at the tabernacle, they shall have charge of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and attend to the duties for the people of Israel as they minister at the tabernacle. And here's verse 9. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are wholly given to him from among the people of Israel. And you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But if anyone else comes near, he shall be put to death. Verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of the firstborn that opens the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine, and on the day that I slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn of Israel, both of man and beast. They shall be mine, I am the Lord. And so the Israelites were to offer, and I'm speaking of animals for a second, they were to offer the firstborn in their flocks as a sacrifice. But when it comes to people, and the same way that the tenth plague is the death of the firstborn of Egypt, then God is going to take and select the Levites to be his special possession, his special, kind of use the word, offering. And a whole tribe is going to be devoted to God on behalf of the rest of the people. So what the firstborn meant among the animals for sacrifice is what the tribe of Levi was going to be. And these were set apart and selected. I don't have it here, but as they go into the land, the Levites are not given a territory. Uh, they are given cities sprinkled throughout Israel and the surrounding areas. <clears throat> and so God disperses the Levites among Israel. And rather than being in an area like Judah, then they're in these Levitical cities that are spread uh, throughout Israel. So here's one for uh, a census. <clears throat> And I want to go down to verse 17. Among the sons of Levi, there are three of them, Gerashim, Kohath, and I struggle with this, and Mary, 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 close, you can see what it is. And so of these three sons of Levi, and here's a part of the significance, because God had said in Exodus 19, uh, you're going to be my portable treasure my special possession, and with God literally camping out with his people, then when the pillar of, uh, let's do the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, when that moved, then they packed up literally the tabernacle, and the Levites were in charge of both the uh, packing everything up, the transportation, and then when the cloud stopped, then you get to unpack everything again. Um, ladies, some of your idea of camping out is Motel 6. And I just, I look at this and I think, this would become so tedious. 
All these things would have, and they're holy and they're sacred things, but the Levites are in charge of doing that. So look at these three families. The family of the Gershonites, they were to encamp behind the tabernacle on the west side. So we come to a new area. The Levites are going to re-erect, construct the tabernacle, put everything in order. And while they're there, then this particular group are to be on the west side of the tabernacle. And then you can see all the things that they're supposed to do uh, underlined in italics, the ark, the lampstands, and these other things. Then when you notice the families of Kohath, they're to encamp on the south side of the tabernacle. And here's the items that they're to do. And the families of Mary, they're to encamp on the north side. And they have a lot of the major items that are within the tabernacle. And then when you come down to verse 38, before the tabernacle on the east side, before the tent of meeting, toward the sunrise were Moses, Aaron, and his sons having charge of the rites within the sanctuary. So not only, and this is in another passage that I didn't put down, the Israelites camp in predictable areas, but when they stop and they erect the tabernacle, then the family of Levi is to be the closest proximity to the tabernacle. And so here again is this holy place, holy of holies, and the tribe of Levi are the people who live closest to the tabernacle because that's their charge and their service to help take care of it. So at the very bottom, the Lord says to Moses, number all the first males, firstborn males of the people of Israel from a month old and upward and take their number by name and you shall take the Levites for me, I am the Lord. Instead of the firstborn of the people of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of the firstborn of the cattle of Israel, and take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle, and the Levites shall be mine, I am the Lord. And so that's just kind of a snapshot that I wanted to kind of take and to say out of these 12 tribes, God chooses this particular tribe and they're going to be his selected, chosen people. And all of the priests are to come only from this particular tribe. Now, I want to go down underneath the, the, the two lines, about two-thirds of the way down. And I want us just to stop and think, what does this say to us about Christ as our high priest? And like I said, it's because of, and I, again, I just, I just shudder when I think about this, God required the death of a sinless human being in order for his blood to be accepted as the sacrifice for my sin. And I've often thought how many oceans of blood were shed in that 1,500 years under the, the covenant of Moses. And you'll see these special times where they will get together and this hundreds and hundreds of animals are going to be sacrificed. And this was what they were asked to do under the covenant of Moses. And then when we come to the new covenant and the Lamb of God dies on the cross, then it is a complete one-time sacrifice. But God required the death of an innocent one to acquit the guilty. And that's still something that is just absolutely amazing. Pioneer preachers, and I'm talking about the guys who um, spread the gospel across uh, the frontier of early America, uh, they often spoke of Jesus in terms of prophet, priest, and king. And when you read some of their sermons, these were very familiar terms that they used. And when I read the book of Luke, I oftentimes think of Jesus wearing the mantle of a prophet. He stands up in his home synagogue and reads from Isaiah 61, and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. And the same way that prophets did specific things in the Old Testament, Jesus does that. And then all the way to the very end on the road to Emmaus, then beginning with Moses, 
and the prophets. Then he explains all of these things to them. And so Jesus wears the mantle of a prophet. But he also, from the book of Hebrews, is the priest. And this is this very unique role. And we understand the function of what Jesus is going to do in heaven because we have the object lesson of the high priest that's going to be offering sacrifices and blood in the Old Testament. And then the word king, um, it, it just drips with irony. Let's put a crown of thorns on this guy and put a purple robe on him and fall down and in mockery worship him. And especially in the Gospel of Mark, I read that. And, and I'll just say this for myself, but I oftentimes think, do I worship half as intently in spirit and in truth as they did in mockery? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's, it's, it's such a tragedy that they're going to ridicule and mock the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so look at all the things they do. Here's the purple robe, here's the staff, here's the crown. They're going to you know, bow down and worship him, all these things. And I think, do I worship in spirit and truth nearly as focused and as intently as they did in ridicule? So prophet, priest, and king. When you look at the first asterisk, prophets were uniquely called to serve regardless of their genealogy and their background. And I just took two of these. For example, Isaiah is going to have a lot of associations in the royal court. And Isaiah is going to minister and prophesy from 740 to 700. And as we noticed previously, the northern ten tribes are going to fall in 721. And right in the middle of Isaiah's ministry, the northern ten tribes are going to be carried away. So here's a prophet that's in the royal court. And then when you just look by way of contrast, then here's Amos. And um, Amos is a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees. Uh, apparently the sycamore trees, there was a, a, a part where they would kind of lance the fruit to open it up. Can I use the word migrant worker? Uh, there's different kinds of sheep that are in Palestine, but uh, the sheep that are used for Amos are kind of a real runty kind of... Um, hardy type group, nothing that you'd take to a show or anything. Um, <laughs> we used to have a, a, a Hereford cattle auction in Sayre when I was growing up, and a lot of times guys, especially if you were, you know, 12 or 13, would pay you to wash these Hereford bulls, and most of them were on a leash and they were trained, but there was one set of them that the foxes brought that this was maybe the second time they'd ever seen human beings in their life. And so there was double panels on theirs. There were no halters on them. And you cleared the aisle. When we came to wash them, you cleared every human being out. And they ran into the wash rack. And Mr. Fox would put on the sound of an auctioneer. And they would just be running round and round in the washroom like a, like a, in a, in a wash tub. And he would squirt dish detergent on them and water. And he'd say, look at how they settle down when they hear this auctioneer. <laughs> And it was, just, it was just the craziest thing. If, if you brought, bought Mr. Fox's cattle, they didn't have to be babied and taken care of because, like I said, this was maybe the second or third time they had seen human beings. And it was just, it was such a contrast. Here are these on halters and, you know, high bread and everything. <laughs> and then you cleared the ring and here came. That's what Amos was. Amos was a migrant worker who has these little runty sheep he, he works and just does everything he can to make a living. And look at the contrast. Isaiah living in the king's court, having royal relationships. And then God also chooses an Amos. And the contrast is God chooses each individual prophet to speak for him. But the contrast is when you come to the priests and also to the kings, then they are in their position because of genealogy. And so while God will say, you're my prophet, you're going to speak for me, then the priests and Levites, and this is why, and I know this is tedious sometimes, but this is why the genealogies are so important. And especially as the people go into captivity, and as they come back, you have that promise made to Abraham, and to keep the genealogy clean, then they, they have to have these records. And so in contrast, both priests... They must be from the tribe of Levi. 
and kings will be from the tribe of Judah, especially in the south, then their position is based on genealogy. But here's Jesus in the book of Hebrews. And the writer says, where there is a change of the law, there must be a change of the priesthood. Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah. No priest in the Old Testament was from Judah. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there is necessarily a change of the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And this is what I think is so helpful. And again, going back to the shadow and to the type, we see all of these people anointed as priests all through the Old Testament because they're the tribe of Levi, and that's what God had asked them to do. That was the regulations under the covenant of Moses. But in contrast, when we come to the new covenant, then we have a priest from the tribe of Judah. And so I, I have a couple of dear, dear friends that um, uh, one, for example, is the Seventh-day Adventist. He's one of the most spiritually minded, godly people you would ever meet. Uh, something about God is on his lips when you come and go. You know, either God bless you or something else. And it's just so sad because they try to pull over parts of the old covenant into the new. And you just want to say to him, no, the old covenant is nailed to the cross. The old covenant is finished. And for example, because Jesus is our high priest... And Jesus has gone into heaven with his blood to offer atonement, redemption, ransom for our sins. Then we cannot be under the old covenant or Jesus would have sinned. And it's, it's that clear. Jesus would have sinned to be the high priest under the covenant of Moses. But that's why we have this new covenant as is described and as prophesied even from Jeremiah. And so there's two things that I want to notice about Jesus that I think are so essential for us. Rather than genealogy, rather than it being a matter of family, there are two things under the new covenant why Jesus is our high priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not according to legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Isn't that a wonderful description of Jesus? Jesus is high priest, one time sacrifice, able to intercede for us forever because of the power of an indestructible life. In 2013, I did 35 funerals. And the first four days of, sorry, the first 12 days of 2014 did four. So I basically did 40 funerals in a year. Can I say leaving the lights on the vehicle overnight and the battery kind of goes, I mean, you just imagine doing 40 funerals in a year and just all the things that are, they're going. And you're just reminded over and over the outer man decays, the inner man is being renewed day by day, none of us are permanent. We're all temporal, with the exception of Jesus. And because of the power of an indestructible life, then he is going to be at the right hand of God, interceding for all people in humanity from the cross until God sends him back. Not because of his family of descent, but because of the uniqueness of the power of an indestructible life. The other quotation here at the very bottom, those who formerly became priests took their office without an oath, but this one was addressed with an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. And this makes Jesus, this word here is surety. Some translations will say the guarantee of a better covenant. And that's why when we talked about the covenant with Noah and Abraham, and David, and Christ, 
We use the word unilateral because the new covenant does not depend upon us. The new covenant is on Jesus. And because he has the power of an indestructible life, because he has offered the one-time sacrifice, then he speaks to God on our behalf. And again, see the difference? The prophet speaks to us on behalf of God. Jesus speaks to God on our behalf. And this is where this term intercede comes for, where Jesus intercedes for us. Now, it's not because it's not important, but I just wanted to focus specifically on this because sometimes in this section of Leviticus and other things, uh, we can get lost with the details. And I think it's just helpful to see why God gave so many descriptions and so many things in the object lesson of the physical priesthood. And I think it's specifically to help us understand what Jesus is going to do and to be for us as our high priest. Now, in the book of Numbers, in the Hebrew, the the book is actually entitled In the Wilderness. And what's going to take place is that our details are primarily the, the second year and then from the 38th year to the 40th. And God is going to move the people from Mount Sinai, take them to the plains of Moab, and he's going to send in the 12 spies. And when the spies come back, 10 gave the report, we can't do this. Joshua and Caleb are the exception. And because of their rebellion, then an entire generation of people are going to die over the next 40 years. And uh, this is just such a sad, such a profoundly sad part of Scripture because God had been working, God had been fulfilling His promises, and He had told Abraham, your descendants are going to go into Egypt. They're going to be there 400 years. And right on time, God sends Moses, God brings them out, and then God brings them right to the edge of the promised land, and they send the spies in. And because the majority of the people accepted the report, this can't be done, and the unbelief and the murmuring that took place, then an entire generation of people are going going to die in the wilderness. And to me, that's just one of the really, really sad parts. If you have your Old Testament, turn to, to Numbers 13, 12, and 13. It's amazing how superstitious some people are about the number 13. I was born on the 13th, so for me it's a lucky number. And you know, people who who have this diversion to the number 13. When I come to Numbers 13, I just have an expression in my mind. When God sends out the spies, this is the beginning of the wheels falling off the wagon. And again, just think numerically for a second. We're going to find that 603,550 young men from 20 up through fighting age are going to be numbered in the census. And then you start doing the addition of their wives, their sisters, their children, the people who are older and the people who are younger. And there are going to be thousands and thousands of people who are going to be buried in the sands while they're wandering for this 40 years because of unbelief. And so the spies are sent out in chapter 13. And when they come back, an adverse report is given. And I want us to notice, though, in verse 14, because the word that's used here is the word murmuring. And I want to be understood. Sometimes I wish I could just ask each one of you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's amazing to me that there are people that I know who would never steal, who would never kill, and would never commit adultery, but just murmur and complain all the time. And when you look at this, they're not sent into the wilderness because of any of these other things. They're sent into the wilderness because of murmuring and complaining. And when you come across the term murmuring, whether it's in Numbers or whether it's in 1 Corinthians, Murmuring is a synonym for unbelief. And when you notice what takes place in chapter 14, Joshua and Caleb say, we can take this land. But I want to read this section, and I'm in Numbers 14, beginning with verse 10. The glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. 
And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe me in spite of the signs I have wrought before them? I will strike them with a pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. And here's what's very important. God is going to fulfill his purposes either with or without the cooperation of people. And for us as human beings, if God has been working on something for over 400 years, it just seems just so difficult that he's going to say to Moses, it's kind of like you just step aside and we're going to wipe out this whole group of people. And what I started with Abraham, I'll start all over with you. And Moses intercedes for the people. God, he pleads for them. And God listens to that and chooses not to do that. But this is what I was saying earlier. Look at the faithfulness of God. He sends Moses the ten plagues. He's going to send the quail when they're complaining about their food. God's going to take care of them and provide for them. And yet over and over they complain. And one of the verses that I have circled in Numbers 14 is down in verse 22. None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I brought about in Egypt and in the wilderness, and they have put me to the proof or to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice. And it's going to happen over and over and again. I say this tongue in cheek, but I also kind of feel this. If I'm Joshua, a little bit later, Moses has died, and the people come to Joshua and say, Joshua, we're going to follow you just like we did Moses. I would want to run over the next hill and just disappear. And over and over again, Moses intercedes, Moses pleads for the people, and God's faithfulness is shown in spite of the faithlessness of the people. Last thing today, if you notice in verse 30 of chapter 14, not of those who came into the land which I swore will make you dwell except Caleb and Joshua the son of Nun. And you'll see in verse 24, Caleb has a different spirit and has followed me fully. So just think about this, and I wouldn't want to be pushed to a specific number, but I wonder, I'm thinking about this thing about wide is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. How narrow is narrow? When we go back to Noah, I just wonder how many thousands and thousands of people were alive and how many people got in the ark? Eight. And then we have thousands and thousands of people come out of the land of Egypt. They're delivered by God. And how many of that generation went into the promised land? Two. So just think about the importance that sometimes murmuring is a complaining is an acceptable practice. But when you look at it from God's point of view, murmuring is a synonym for unbelief. And because of their unbelief, the people were not able to enter the promised land. God bless. Have a good day.